This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229 MRI signals and sequences offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The second lecture, case-based imaging, is broken down into four parts, and lecture 2D covers phase and frequency encoding. The learning objectives for this lecture include being able to describe three different roles for gradients, outline the steps required for spatial localization, and explain the role of frequency and phase encoding. Spatial encoding, as we saw in one of the previous lectures, includes three key steps. Slice selection, that is, you have to pick a slice. Phase encoding, in that you have to encode one of two dimensions within the slice. And frequency encoding, also known as readout. You have to encode the other dimension within the slice. And these events happen in sequence. You first slice select, then phase encode, and then frequency encode for conventional Cartesian case space imaging. So let's first begin by talking about phase encoding. Phase encoding consists of a phase encoding gradient, which is typically of a magnitude that changes with each TR. It can, in fact, be played out with other gradients, which include things like crushers, slice selection rephasers, or readout dephasing gradients. Here on the right hand side is a diagram of five phase encoding steps going from a high positive encoding gradient to a low negative encoding gradient. This is conventionally used with Cartesian imaging, and it occurs after excitation, after the slice has been excited, but before readout, before the data is acquired uh, for acquisition. It adds a linear spatial variation of phase across the image. You can do phase encoding in one direction for two-dimensional imaging, or if you excite a thick slab, you can use phase encoding in two directions for true, inherent, three-dimensional imaging. We only typically acquire one phase encoding step per echo, and consequently, we have to acquire dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of echoes uh, to fill case space with sufficient data to reconstruct an image of the underlying object. So gradients move us around in case space, and so one can ask, where am I in case space when playing a sequence of gradients? So here we show a gradient uh, echo sequence. The RF pulse is played in concert with a slice selection gradient to excite a slice. We then rephase the spin in the through slice dimension to increase the signal to noise. And we follow this with two uh, uh, simultaneously applied gradients along the phase encode axis and the frequency encoding axis, and these will move us out to a corner of case space. As these are both negative gradients, we'll move out to the negative negative quadrant of case space. Now, case space is defined by the integral of the gradient waveform uh, as a function of time. And so we can map out for each of these gradients on the left hand side if the gradient is turned on for a period of time and then turned off we can see that we would be moving out, uh, we'd be accumulating uh, case space uh, as a function of time. And that's true of both the readout gradient and the phase encoding gradient. And so we're moving out uh, to increasingly negative uh, case space positions along both the read and phase encoding direction. And that's what we see in the case space uh, figure shown on the top right here. Now on the second uh, event here, the readout event, which follows after the frequency encoding gradient, we have a large positive encoding gradient, and that's going to move us positively from our current negative case space position across the middle of case space to the DC component, all the way through to a positive component of uh, positive uh, coordinate of case space. And our phase encoding gradient will have main constant uh, that uh, was turned on and then turned off, and so the K encoding uh, waveform uh, is constant as a function of time. And so you can see that we're moving constantly in the phase encode, uh, sorry, at a constant phase encode value uh, as a function of the readout uh, dimension here. Of course, we can repeat this process for many different phase encoding steps from large positive ingredients to larger negative encoding gradients, and consequently map out different trajectories in case space. Uh, now you may remember from earlier courses in uh, magnetic resonance imaging that the field of view is defined as one over delta ky. And this is a really important relationship to remember um, as it helps you build an intuition for how we design case-based trajectories so that we capture uh, an unaliased uh, picture of the underlying object. 
the delta ky is also equal to one over the number of phase encode steps times the resolution. This is just inverting the, the uh, relationship shown here for the field of view because the field of view is just the number of phase encoding steps times the resolution. We could pick, for example, 128 uh, phase encoding steps and we could pick 0.1 centimeter uh, imaging resolution, that's one millimeter imaging resolution, and we could compute the delta ky. We could also think about the KY max that we might achieve, and the KY max would just be half the number of phase encodes, sometimes correcting so that we're centered about the middle of k-space, times the delta KY that we computed previously. And we can see that in this case, we would have a delta KY of about 4.95 inverse centimeters. And that represents a high spatial frequency because this is our maximum KY that we would use for this particular uh, image acquisition. We could also then calculate the duration of the phase encoding gradient uh, using this expression shown here. We typically would want to use the maximum available gradient amplitude so that we could move across k-space as quickly as possible. And we would also use the ky max that we computed previously and then everything else as a constant. So using this expression, we could define that the duration of our phase encoding gradient would be about 200.290 uh, uh, milliseconds. And in general, we could define a relationship for stepping through k-space, that is for the mth ky uh, phase encode step. Uh, we would just uh, have the total number of phase encode steps divided by two uh, minus some index m. And if we multiply by our ky uh, stepping, then we can move through k-space uh, from our maximum uh, uh, ky uh, max value to our uh, negative ky max value. Okay, so let's think about frequency encoding. Frequency encoding gradient is, consists of a constant magnitude uh, gradient for Cartesian imaging, and it uh, would not include any simultaneous RF events or other gradient events like phase encoding, slice encoding, or crushers. So frequency encoding is relatively unique in that it's the only event uh, that, we would, that would be played out uh, at this particular point in time. The readout prephasing gradient uh, comes just before the actual readout gradient itself, and it helps prepare the, uh, the spin phase so that it peaks, uh, has a peak echo amplitude that occurs uh, near the middle of the readout, which we refer to as the echo time. This is also uh, known as the readout dephasing gradient. The readout gradient itself adds a linear variation, a linear spatial variation in frequency across the object, and we use this for uh, mapping out the spatial frequency content of the underlying object. And of course, it helps us form an echo, which we record uh, using the, the coils and receiver system. So we've seen this example before. Uh, this is an, uh, a gradient echo sequence with uh, slice selective excitation, phase encoding, and the readout gradient. The readout prephaser helps prepare the spin phase and move us across k-space so that during the readout acquisition, uh, the readout gradient, uh, as we're moving across k-space, we'll come through the middle of k-space to acquire uh, a line of k-space that helps us uh, fill in uh, some of the k-space matrix necessary for uh, sampling the spatial frequencies for the underlying object. Here we have the general k-space expression which shows that k-space is related to the integral of the gradient waveform as a function of time. If the gradient waveform is itself a constant amplitude gradient, then this expression simplifies as follows. So what we can do is look at the signal equation, uh, which again graphically and mathematically we show is related to the integral of the state of the transverse magnetization in the object, weighted by some spatial frequency sampling pattern. And the spatial frequency sampling pattern is in turn related to k-space, uh, but the k-space really is arising as a function of the applied gradient amplitude interaction and the duration of the applied gradient. How long has the gradient been turned on for? So for example, we can look at uh, the middle point here in k-space, and this may represent uh, a point in time before or, or just as we're about to turn on uh, the frequency encoding gradient for the first time. And at this point in time, uh, the, the gradient, um, the k-space weighting function here is going to be zero everywhere because time is zero. And that means that uh, there will be uh, no encoding as a function of space across the object itself. Oops. And if there's no um, 
uh, weighting of k-space across the object itself, then all the spins would perhaps appear to be pointed in the same direction. They've been tipped down in one direction, and while they're processing at the Larmor frequency uh, in the rotating frame, we would picture them all to be in, uh, in alignment as shown here. And this is in distinction to what we'll show next. And so here we show that we, the gradient has now been turned on for a certain period of time. And that time has allowed for spins at different positions to accumulate different amounts of phase because spins at different positions see different magnetic fields. And if they see different fields, they see different frequencies. And so now we have a distribution of phases across the object. So this is related to uh, how we perform actually phase encoding. Uh, but if we do this as an active process, that is the gradient is left on and we continue to leave it on for longer and longer periods of time, then the phase evolves as follows. So as we've left the gradient on for a longer period of time, we can see that there's more phase accumulation at each uh, spin position. Uh, and if we leave it on for even longer, then there's even more phase accumulation as a function of each uh, spin's position. Uh, and of course, you'll notice that the gradient that we've turned on is just a left-right gradient, probably an x-gradient, and that there's no difference in the phase uh, or uh, the accumulated phase or the underlying active frequency as a function of the y direction. So this is in principle how a gradient can be used uh, to encode the phase, uh, but also the frequency. So let's look at this uh, in, in action. And so I'll, I'll walk through this diagram a couple times. On the right-hand side here, we see the activity of a frequency encoding gradient. So we have the pre-phasing gradient, and then we have the readout gradient. And on the bottom left here, we have uh, how the magnetic field is changing as a function of time. And it's coordinated with uh, the sequence diagram on the right-hand side. And so at the beginning now, the field is pitched, uh, say, from top left to bottom right, and it quickly switches to bottom right to top left. Uh, because the readout gradient has changed from being a negative gradient to being a positive gradient. So here we'll see it flip quickly. This is the pre-phasing gradient. And now the readout gradient is turned on. And at a time that's coming up, you'll see all the spins are going to come into an alignment. And that's the formation of the echo itself. Uh, and so we'll watch this one more time. And at the very beginning, this is spin dephasing, all the spins coming out of alignment. Now the gradient's been turned on positively. They come into alignment. They phase uh, align and then they come out of alignment again. And so this is what's happening to the spin system during the entire readout gradient, including the pre-phasing gradient and then the constant magnitude readout gradient. Okay, so let's think about the readout gradient amplitude. Uh, typically, uh, we might think about using high receiver bandwidth. Uh, this is the range of frequencies across the object that we're encoding. Uh, we could use stronger gradients to have higher receiver gradient, uh, higher receiver bandwidth rather. Uh, we might want a large range of this will invoke rather a large range of frequencies across the field of view, sometimes measured across the pixel. Uh, higher receiver bandwidths will give us less chemical shift. We have a larger frequency difference per pixel, and this means that the small effects of chemical shift are mitigated. Um, it will give us lower signal to noise because we typically have shorter acquisition times associated with high receiver bandwidths. But that also shortens our echo time because we're moving across k-space faster and we may actually regain a little bit of signal because of that. So by definition, the range of frequencies across the field of view is, equal, is shown by this expression here, which relates the applied gradient amplitude and the chosen field of view. Now with this expression here, the user can pick, of course, two out of three. And usually what the user is picking on the scanner console is the field of view. They have some idea about the geometry that they want to cover and they pick the receiver bandwidth because this directly affects image quality in terms of chemical shift and signal to noise. And so then we need to calculate the gradient amplitude. Uh, this of course is done behind the scenes by the scanner. So we can rearrange this expression. Uh, and if we chose a field of view of 30 centimeters and we choose a bandwidth, the receiver bandwidth of 32 kilohertz, then we see that we need to apply a half gauss per centimeter of gradient amplitude. Uh, in addition to calculating the readout amplitude, we would want to calculate the readout gradient. Uh, we know that the temporal uh, Nyquist sampling uh, requires that we have a delta t uh, equal to 1 over twice the delta frequency. Uh, so again, we can rearrange this expression. We have the receiver bandwidth shown here on the bottom, and we can get the delta uh, sampling step time, which is about 15 microseconds in this case. Now, if we want to 
sample uh, in 15 microsecond steps for every readout point. Uh, we might be sampling 128 readout points for a 128 pixel image, multiplying that by uh, the delta time step for each uh, um, measured point gives us a readout duration of about 200 micro, uh, 2,000 microseconds. So we've reviewed uh, various aspects of phase and frequency encoding. Uh, please click below for additional lectures on upcoming topics.